Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today we gather together to celebrate the life and to mourn the loss of our sister in Christ, Margaret Jean Scott. In our Presbyterian tradition, the memorial service is a worship service. So this morning we will sing and we will pray and we will read Holy Scripture. We will honor our God and Father, our Savior Jesus Christ, and the mighty Holy Spirit. In that spirit, I would invite you to begin the service today with a uh, reading, a responsive reading of the 121st Psalm as it is printed in your bulletin. I will be the leader and you will be the people. I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence does my help come. My help comes from the Lord. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. We will now pray together at the conclusion of my prayer. We will join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Here at First Presbyterian, we are debtors But don't worry, we always make room for the trespassers as well. Would you join me in prayer? Merciful God and Father, we thank you so much for the life of our sister Margaret. We rejoice in her testimony, in her witness to her faith in her Savior Jesus Christ. We know that she met the end of this mortal life with courage, And we trust and believe that she has entered into her eternal rest. Father, even as we celebrate uh, Margaret and her, her life and we reflect upon her, we remember your saving mercy given in Jesus Christ. We also think this morning of this family. We pray that you would bless them, that you would surround them, that you would uphold them with your mighty strength. As we walk through this valley of grief, we pray that your presence would light our way. So, Father, we ask that you would bless our worship today, bless these family and friends and fellow church members and former co-workers. Father, be with us in the midst of these things. And now we all join together in the prayer that Jesus Christ himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. We will now sing hymn number 21 in the red hymnal, How Great Thou Art. You may stand if you are able to do so.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. We will read together verses 1 through 14 of John chapter 1. Before we read from Holy Scripture, would you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for the gift of the Bible. In seasons like this, your word speaks great consolation and power. We thank you for your word. We pray now through your spirit that you would open this word to our hearing. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Again, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony to bear witness to the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness to the light. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld His glory, glory as if as of the only Son from the Father. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A couple of weeks before Margaret passed away, she called to discuss with me the details of this service. She only asked me to say one particular thing about her. She wanted you to know that she was a child of God. Margaret was God's dear daughter, and therefore she was a sister to us in Christ. I think it is appropriate for us to take a few moments now to think about what it means to be a child of God. The first thing to recognize is that there is a sense in which all people are the children of God. God is our maker. He is the one who has established the days of our lives and the locations of our births. We live and we move and we find our being in God. Human beings were made to know God and to walk with God in fellowship. Every person lives in God's world and finds himself or herself surrounded by untold blessings that flow out of the provision of a kind, heavenly Father. When someone eats a good meal or watches a sunset or listens to moving music, he or she is experiencing the generosity of a beneficent parent. It is a glorious thing to stretch out our limbs in the morning and step into a, wor a world that was made by God and marked by His character and power at every turn. The Bible tells us that we are made in the image of God. Every person has a dignity and value that flows out of this relationship to the Creator. The second thing to realize is that people, people forget that they are God's children and they wander off into the far country. We wander off into the far country. I have wandered off into the far country. The problem is not that God changes who He is toward His creation. 
The problem is that we have changed who we are toward God. We make ourselves into orphans. This is the story of the prodigal son that's recorded for us in Luke chapter 15. Many of you know this story, but let us remember it for a moment. A father had two sons. And the younger boy, the younger of the two sons, asked the father to give him his share of the inheritance. In that culture, the bulk of the inheritance would have gone to the elder son who had to bear the responsibility of becoming the head of house and running the family business. The younger son would have received a share of the inheritance to establish his way in the world. But none of this could happen while the father was alive. So in asking for the inheritance early, the younger son was effectively treating the father as if he were already dead. This boy then ran off to squander his wealth. He was living. He was out there living in the world, reduced to being in a pig pen. He was living as if he had no father who loved him. And this is the problem of humanity. We reject God. We act as if he did not exist. We reject our identity in God. We take the gifts that God has given us and we run off to squander them on our own desires. That leads us to the third thing that we must know, that God did not accept this state of affairs. Instead, God sent forth his son to bear our nature and to live among us. In the story of the prodigal son, the younger son does eventually return. His father welcomes him with immense love and celebration even deciding to throw a party for this recently returned boy. Yet the elder brother, he is not happy with this outcome. He had been dutifully working his whole life to serve the father. When the younger son took his inheritance and ran off, the elder brother knew that the family pie had just gotten one slice smaller. When the father killed the fatted calf and threw a bash for this returned runaway, the elder brother was angry because all of the resources that were being used were supposed to be his one day. Because he was supposed to get everything else. Everything that was happening was supposed to be his when he inherited the family business. So how could his father use up his stuff to welcome back this sinner? But I want you to think about what Jesus did when God sent his son into the world. When he came to earth and when he took up our nature, he became the true elder brother of a race full of runaways. But as our true elder brother, he didn't keep himself out in the cold. No, he acted in ways completely contrary to the elder brother of the story as it's recorded in Luke 15. Our elder brother, Jesus, he traveled to the far country where the runaways are. He traveled to the far country and he got down into the pig pen so that we could come back to the father. And then when the father celebrated our return, our elder brother, Jesus, celebrated right alongside us, rejoicing, rejoicing that his inheritance was used for our blessing and our joy. Jesus did not stand in the cold and grumble that rebels got off the hook. He desired that his inheritance become our inheritance. He did not grasp onto his right, but was willing to die on a cross so that we could come back to God. And that leads us to the fourth thing to know today. To recognize that Jesus has risen from the dead. And now ordinary men and women can come back to the family and become children of God. Once again, by believing in Jesus. 
It is right there in the passage that I I just read a few moments ago from John chapter 1. It says this, But to all who received Him, who believed in His name, He gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And that offer, that offer, it stands before all of us right now. If we believe in Jesus then we are welcomed back to the family and we become adopted children of God. Our long self-imposed exile can come to an end. We become twice-born children who are both products of the Father's creative power and recipients of Christ's saving work. And I believe, based on the conversations that I had with her, based on the faithfulness that I saw in her, that Margaret was was this kind of twice-born child of God. Such a child enjoys dwelling in the Father's presence and revels in the sweet news of forgiveness of sins and spiritual power through connection to our elder brother Jesus. Are you living as a child of God right now, enjoying the blessings and responsibilities of being a part of the family? Or are you yet a child that has cut himself off from his heavenly Father to dwell out in that far country? If the first is true of you, then you have the hope of eternal life in heaven with God and the joy of getting to know God and His family in this world, in this life. If the second is true of you, if you are out there yet wandering in the far country, then I invite you today, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come back home. Come back home and believe in the God who made you and sent Christ to rescue you from your wandering. You can know yourself today as a child of God as a brother or sister within the household of God. Would you join me in prayer? Father, when we are honest with ourselves, we know that we have wondered. We know that we often take the gifts that you give us and we squander them on our own desires. And how thankful we are that there is a way back. And that way back is in Jesus Christ. And we are thankful that there are people before us who have answered that offer, who have accepted that invitation. And we rejoice. We rejoice that they had hope. We rejoice that they had reunion with You, O Heavenly Father. Father, help each one of us to answer that call as Margaret did. Help us to answer that call to come back home to You our Father, and to bask again in your love and joy, that love and joy and forgiveness and freedom which is given to us in our Savior Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray today. Amen. Now, Margaret's daughter Sarah will come forward to share some words with us all. Good morning. Thank you all for coming here today. We so appreciate it. So wonderful to see such happy faces. I just wanted to take a few minutes to focus on the blessings in my mom's final weeks because there were so many, so many. And I, I, it brings me peace to think of the blessings and I hope that it will bring you peace also. I've narrowed it down to 10, although there were many. So my mom went into the hospital in early January, and once she was released, we, she and I went back to her house for four days just to spend some time packing and just getting be- ready for a trip to our house because we were moving her to our house. And I observed over those days my mom on the phone with numerous friends and family members, and it was such a blessing to listen to her thank people for their friendship, to talk about their memories, and to say goodbye. I mean, what a blessing to say goodbye to someone and to be able to thank them for their friendship. It was, it was amazing. 
When we arrived back home, all of my mom's medical equipment was there ready for her. It was, we, was, we just walked in and everything was set. But more importantly, her favorite nurse was there. My daughter, Eve, is a nursing student, and she is my mom's favorite nurse. And my mom loved it when she took care of her. In fact, when we kind of took turns, and my mom had a bell, and when she'd ring the bell, and when I'd show up, she looked at me like, you? She didn't want me. She, well, where's Eve? Why isn't Eve here? So it was such a blessing that Eve was able to take care of her and that they could have that bond and connect over those weeks. What a blessing. The next blessing was one day it all began, and our mailbox was flooded with cards, mostly from her friends and family here at the church. It was amazing. I was taking pictures and sending them to my kids, saying, look at all these cards that Grandma is getting. She was so touched, and she enjoyed opening every one. We were trying to kind of spread it out, but this more and more came every day. So it's just a blessing to see that love poured out, and the cards are in the back of the church because I, I looked at it as this is love in action. This is what it looks like, so thank you. On Saturday, before my mom passed, my brother Jeff arrived with my mom's favorite chair. She really wanted her chair, so he made the trip up and brought her chair to her. And we hadn't placed it yet in the place where she wanted it because we weren't really sure where it was going to go. And she disappeared all, one day, and we couldn't find her. And all of a sudden, we went to, it was in the foyer. The chair was in the foyer. We went and looked, and she's sitting in the dark in the foyer in her favorite chair. Nothing says home and love like your favorite chair. And we, she joked with us that when she wasn't in her chair, if anyone cared to sit in it, they would have to leave a quarter on the armrest for her. So um, she, that was a blessing that she got to spend some time in her favorite chair. My mom hadn't left the house when we moved her back because it was so cold and snowy. So she was, and she didn't have a lot of energy. So she had been homebound in our house. And so my daughter Eve came up with the idea that they were going to go on a little field trip. So they decided, Scott, you'll appreciate this, they decided to go to none other than Chick-fil-A. So they, we got her oxygen in the car, we got her in the car, and off they went. It looked like Thelma and Louise pulling out of the, their driveway. They had a wonderful time. They just ate in the car, but it was just the getting away and the taking the time to do something that meant a lot to her. So they, she loved that, and they planned their next outing on their way home that day. Um, my mom's final day, uh, before she went to be with the Lord, she had very little energy. And um, the best way that I found to help her get up was to give her a big bear hug. So I am so grateful for that blessing of every one of those bear hugs that day. I didn't know that, I didn't know that those would be the last hugs, but it was just awesome to have those hugs. God, God was way ahead of us on everything. Um, Wednesday was the day she passed, and in the morning I got a call from the hospice chaplain. And we didn't expect to hear from him until Friday because he had come on a Friday before. But he called out of the blue on Wednesday morning and said, can I come in 20 minutes? I hesitated a bit because she was sleeping, but I said, sure, come. So he came, and they, he read the Bible to her, and they prayed together. And the last thing they did is they sang, how great thou art. And I even I were in shock as, because she, had, she, could, she was having a difficult time breathing. But the fact that she could not only breathe, but she was belting out those words with him, it was the most beautiful thing. And that song will always hold a special place in my heart. So what a blessing to have that time and to have the chaplain come on her final day. He, couldn't, he called me the next day and couldn't believe it. But again, God was way ahead of us. Um, my mom wasn't eating a whole lot on the final day. And I was encouraging her to eat, so I asked her what she wanted for lunch. And she said she wanted her hot fudge sundae that had come from McDonald's a few days ago, and she was slowly working on it. So before I delivered her hot fudge sundae, I thought, well, we shouldn't eat ice cream alone. So I loaded up a big bowl, and together we had her final meal, which was ice cream. So what a blessing to have ice cream for your final meal. My prayer from the time my mom was diagnosed, which was October of 22, was that she wouldn't suffer. I didn't want her to suffer. I didn't want her to be in pain. I didn't want it to drag out. And I, God really granted that prayer. He really did, because she, she passed on a Wednesday, and she really didn't start to decline until Monday. So what, a, what a, a, an amazing blessing for all of us that she did not suffer. 
Most of you probably know the symbolism of a cardinal and the saying that when cardinals appear, angels are near. A cardinal had an, uh, an extra special place in my mom's heart because my dad went to Cooley High School and they were the Cooley Cardinals. So she was always on the lookout for cardinals. So the morning after she passed, my husband woke up. It was still dark, pitch dark, and he could hear a cardinal singing outside the window. Couldn't see it, but it was plain as day. That cardinal was singing. A few hours later, the equipment company came to pick up all of her medical equipment. And as everyone was walking in and out of our front door, we looked up and perched at the very top of a tree was a cardinal watching. And I believe that was her way of saying, I'm home. I made it. I'm not here. I'm home. I'm where I belong. So those are the blessings, the, some of the many blessings in her final days. And again, I thank you for being here. And my mom would want me to finish by saying that she is a child of God. Thank you. Dear friends, the Christian church of all traditions and backgrounds shares together a common creed known as the Apostles' Creed. And so we will recite that creed together, the faith that we share, the faith that Margaret shared. Uh, I would invite you to stand for the reading of the Apostles' Creed as it is printed in your bulletin. And then after that, we will sing number 542 in the hymnal, Near to the Heart of God. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Number 542.
before we dismiss our service, I invite you to hear the precious words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Brothers and sisters, I will now uh, offer a closing prayer. In particular, I'll pray for the lunch that's downstairs. Uh, there is a luncheon, and you're invited to just head on down to our fellowship hall to participate in that. But I'll go ahead and pray for our meal, and then after my prayer, I will offer you a benediction. Let us pray. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, the precious words of blessing that Sarah shared. Thank you for these hymns, uh, the statement of Christian belief that transcends the ages. Thank you for our sister in Christ, Margaret. I thank you for each person present who has been impacted by her life. I pray that as we depart today that you would bless each one of us. Father, we pray that you bless the meal that we are about to eat. We pray that it would be a time of fellowship and joy and remembrance. And we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I would invite you to join hands with someone near you as you receive the benediction. Here at First Presbyterian, we sometimes create all sorts of weird shapes at the end of service as people are joining hands. So go ahead and, and, and make those weird shapes for us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the guidance and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you forever and ever. Amen.
Yeah. <laughs> 